Hi, everyone. So what we're going to be talking about in this lecture is a set of ideas called the shifting theorems. And this is aiming at building out a large library of transforms and inverse transforms that we can use to study the sorts of functions that come up in wide uh, range of applications in differential equations. You should recall from the previous videos that we pointed out that the, the big difficulty that we have in working with the Laplace transform is just having a big set of things available that we can work with. And the shifting theorems are going to be a first step towards developing a library of stuff that we can use that show up all the time in physical modeling. So let's look at what's known as the first shifting theorem. And to do so, we're going to look at a particular combination of functions in the Laplace transform. So if I computed the Laplace transform of an exponential e to the at times any function I want, so some function f of t. And one of the reasons we might think to do this is that the Laplace transform of just e to the at by itself, the exponentials inside the integral combine together, and it gave us a very straightforward integral. So maybe inspired by that, we can just look at this Laplace transform and just see what happens. So if I write down the definition of the Laplace transform, I'm going to get the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the at f of t e to the minus st dt. And then just like before, we could take the two exponentials and we can combine them together. That's going to get us the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t e to the minus s minus a t dt. Now this thing is a Laplace transform, but it's not a Laplace transform in terms of a variable s. It's a Laplace transform in terms of a variable s minus a. This is f, but with s minus a plugged in in place of s. You can see that right here. And this is the content of the first shifting theorem. That if I take the Laplace transform of some function, f of t, and I multiply it by e to the at, what happens is that induces a shift in the Laplace domain. So the Laplace transform of a function times an exponential turns into a shift of the Laplace transform of f. This is the first shifting theorem. And then we're going to just use the notation the Laplace transform of f is equal to capital F of s. And what the theorem says is that the Laplace transform of e to the at f of t is equal to the Laplace transform of f, but shifted. And likewise, we can go backwards. If I take the inverse Laplace transform of the shift of a pattern that I recognize, then that's going to pull back into an exponential times f of t. So the content of the first shifting theorem is that multiplication by an exponential function in the time domain turns into a shift in the Laplace domain. So let's look at what this looks like by way of example. So we'll start by just computing some Laplace transforms. So example one, we're going to take the Laplace transform of e to the 5t cosine of 4t. Now the way this works is we're supposed to find the Laplace transform of the cosine of 4t, but then shift the variable. So one way that you can do that, or that you can encode what's happening here, is you can write this as the Laplace transform of the cosine of 4t, but then when you're all done with it, what you're going to do is you're going to take the variable s and you're going to replace it by s minus 5. That this records what the exponential did. Because remember, what the theorem says is, take the Laplace transform of f and then shift it by whatever the power of the exponential was. OK, so in this case, the Laplace transform of cosine of 4t, since everybody has this memorized already without looking it out on table, is s over s squared plus 16 except I still have to shift the s variable to be s minus 5 to account for the fact that the original function was multiplied by an exponential. And that gets me s minus 5 over s minus 5 squared, s minus 5 squared plus 16. That's what a Laplace transform looks like when you have a shift in the Laplace domain. So let's look at another example. 
If I have a Laplace transform of a generic e to the at, and I multiply it by some polynomial term t to the n, what the first shifting theorem tells me that I'm supposed to do is take the Laplace transform of t to the n, and then when I'm all finished with it, shift the s into an s minus a. So again, this is the first shifting theorem. Okay, now of course, the Laplace transform of t to the n, which we all have memorized, is equal to n factorial over s to the n plus one, but I'm gonna replace s with s minus a to account for the shift, and that gets me n factorial over s minus a to the n plus one, okay? So these are pretty easy to do. The idea is that you store the fact that you're gonna shift, which takes care of the action of the exponential, you do the Laplace transform like normal, and then at the end, you just put the shift in. Now, the more difficult direction for these tends to be the backwards direction, because it means that you have to identify and make sure that every single copy of the variable that you think is shifted has the same shift. So we're going to talk about inverse Laplace transforms with the first shifting theorem. So if I was looking at the inverse Laplace transform and somebody has already set the shifts up for me, then it's really easy. So for example, I could write down something like three over s minus two squared plus nine. Okay, so first it's a shift in the Laplace domain, which means this is going to correspond to multiplication by an exponential in the time domain. The next thing I need to do is figure out what that exponential is. Well. This is the shift of the variable. The s in here has been shifted to the right by two. So this is gonna be equal to the inverse Laplace transform of this undone shift, s squared plus nine. And then when I'm all finished with it, I better multiply it by an e to the two t because that's where the shift came from. So I can take the shift out of the inverse Laplace transform, but I have to make sure that I record it as multiplication by an exponential in the time domain. Well, now this is easy to compute the Laplace transform of because we have completely memorized our table of basic Laplace transforms and clearly recognize that as a sine. So this is equal to the sine of 3t times e to the 2t. And then if you like, when you're done, you can actually do the Laplace transform and check and make sure that you get what you should have by taking the Laplace transform and then doing the shift. So let's look at a problem where the shift isn't immediately obvious. Suppose I was asked to find the inverse Laplace transform of s minus two over s squared plus two s plus three. In a problem like this, we could use partial fractions to break it up, as long as our denominator is not irreducible, or we're gonna be dealing with complex numbers. More commonly, what will happen if we do have an irreducible quadratic, which I believe this one actually is, is to use completing the square to rewrite the denominator in terms of something squared plus some constant squared. And what that's going to do is it's going to reveal a shift that we can look at and undo with the shifting theorem. So let's look at s minus 2 over s squared plus 2s plus 3. Since the denominator is irreducible, we want it to look like something like something squared plus something else squared, so it will turn into a sine or a cosine. Completing the square on this is going to give us s minus 2 over, um, let's see, so we have an s squared and a 2s and a 1 plus a 2. So I've just taken the 3 and I've broken it up into a 1 and a 2. And the reason I did that is that now I can write s plus 1 squared plus 2. And at this point, that almost looks like the shift of the transform of a sine or a cosine, except that the shift here that we've discovered must be in the problem by completing the square is not actually present in the numerator. So we've written the denominator in terms of a shift of s to s plus one, but the numerator does not have that shift. So what we're going to do now that we've completed the square is we're gonna fix the numerator so that the shifts are all consistent. So this is equal to s plus 1 minus 3 over s plus 1 squared plus 2. And that is going to break up into two pieces, a piece corresponding to a cosine and a piece corresponding to a sine. 
So the rule that we're going to need here, or the two rules we'll need, are that the Laplace transform of the cosine of bt is s over s squared plus b squared. And we're also going to need to know that the Laplace transform of the sine of bt is equal to b over s squared plus b squared. So what I'm looking at here, when I see this right here, what I'm thinking is that I'm looking at a cosine and a sine where b is equal to the square root of 2, because 2 is b squared. So let's take this thing, and we'll put it back up here in the inverse Laplace transform and see what happens. This is equal to the inverse Laplace transform of s plus 1 over s plus 1 squared plus 2. And then there's going to be a minus 3 and an inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 1 squared plus 2. Now, this thing is like a cosine already. But the problem is that this one, there shouldn't be a 1 on top. There has to be a b. But there's no b here. So if I want to put the b here, the b should be the square root of that number. So since b squared is 2, then b should be root 2. So I'm going to stick a root 2 right here. But in order to you know, counteract that, I'm going to have to divide by root 2 right here, which is why I left the bottom of the 3. So I can adjust this to make sure that it looks correct by putting a root 2 here and then dividing by root 2 out here. OK, now let's record the shifts. So to record how we got the s to s plus 1, I'm going to say that this is actually equal to e to the minus t times the inverse Laplace transform of s over s squared plus 2, because that records the shift. In this problem, again, I'm going to have an e to the minus t. And what will be left behind is the inverse Laplace transform of root 2 over s squared plus 2. And now those two things are things that are present on the table. I can use these rules over here now to say that this is e to the minus t times the cosine of root 2t minus 3 over root 2 times e to the minus t times the sine of root 2t. So that's fairly typical of the way these kind of problems come out. Let's do another example of this, because these can be a little bit tricky. So let's look at the problem of finding the inverse Laplace transform of s over s squared plus 4s plus 5. Again, the denominator here is irreducible, and so I can't factor, which means I can't use partial fractions. So I'm going to proceed by completing the square on this and then using the fact that I know that the transforms of s squared plus b squared turn into cosines and sines. Okay. So first thing, we complete the square. If we do that, we're going to get s over s plus 2 squared plus 1. That just has to do with taking the s squared plus 4s, adding a 4, you know, taking so 4 out of the 5 to make the s plus 2 squared, and then there's 1 left over. Now again, that already starts looking like a cosine or a sine that's been shifted by negative 2. The problem is that that s in the numerator does not actually have the shift. So the next step is going to be to fix the numerator. So this step is equal to L inverse of s plus 2 minus 2 over s plus 2 squared plus 1. I haven't changed anything because I added 2 and subtracted 2. But now, everywhere I've got an s, I have it actually as s plus 2. This is equal to the inverse Laplace transform of s plus 2 over s plus 2 squared plus 1 minus 2 times the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 2 squared plus 1. And now I can undo those shifts by pulling out the exponentials in the time domain. So that this is equal to e to the negative 2t times the inverse Laplace transform of s over s squared plus 1 minus 2 e to the minus 2t times the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus 2 squared plus 1. And those are both from the table. This is equal to e to the minus 2t cosine of t minus 2 e to the minus 2t sine of 2t. There's no shift here. I already took the shift out and put in the exponential. OK, so that's an example of how the first shifting theorem works. 
And practice with the first shifting theorem is probably the best way to get the idea of either taking the exponential and turning it into a shift, as we did when we took the forward Laplace transform, or taking the shift out and encoding it in an exponential like we do when we do the inverse Laplace transform. And the same sort of ideas are going to be present when we talk about the second shifting theorem, which involves shifting not in the Laplace domain, but shifting in the time domain instead. And there we're going to have to use something called the unit step or heavy side function to encode that. So that'll be the subject of the next video. Thanks.